What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the channel. I hope you guys are having a great week so far. I know it's only Monday, so it couldn't have gone too bad yet, right? Let's hope not. Let's just get into today's video. Um, I released a poll this past week uh, asking what type of software you guys prefer to use, whether it be proprietary, open source, free, whatever, and got some good feedback on that. So I wanted to kind of discuss something today, and I wanted to talk about the free software movement, typically uh, associated with uh, FOSS, free and open source, Open source is kind of a different thing, not quite with the free uh, free software foundation um, is on par with, but, you know, kind of the same vein. People hear the two and a lot of times just lump them together. Um, but we're really more focused on free uh, software foundations idea of free as in freedom and uh, kind of a couple of the arguments against it and then counterpoints to those arguments. So. Uh, what we mean when we're talking about uh, freeze and freedom is basically the GNU project, I believe it is, Richard Stallman came up with the four freedoms, which are basically you can use it, modify it, study it, and share it, I think is what they are. Um, correct me if I'm wrong on that, but I think that's what I, you can look them up. They're the four, the, the four freedoms of the software foundation. You can find them, I believe on the, the GNU project page or, or website. Um, but that's basically the, the gist of it, uh, to be able to use, modify, share, and study the source code. Um, and along with that is the idea that all software should be like that. And so when people say that, hey, all software should be free, that doesn't mean they're talking about it should be free of charge, uh, because that's just an asinine idea that people who are working on stuff deserve to be paid for their work. It doesn't mean that we're not talking about developers sitting behind a computer hammering away on a keyboard for ramen noodles and little, little more. Uh, we're talking about the freedom to once a project is complete to be able to take that or even incomplete to be able to access that source code and to be able to do what you want with it, anything up to delete it to modify it to change it, whatever. So um, a lot of people say that the cost to make some of these programs is astronomical. Take like AAA games, for example. Um, I believe they've said that AAA games cost roughly uh, $30 million to $500 million, I think is what they're talking about now, to make these AAA games. And that's just a rough estimate. Um, you can look that up. There's some websites, I believe... Um, uh, gamedevelopment.com, I believe, I think is one of them. Um, there, there's a few places you can find this stuff, but uh, they're saying it takes all this money to create these games. Where's that money coming from? You know, these people, yeah, they have investors, they have this stuff, but that doesn't foot the entire bill. So what do they do? They actually charge for the, make a proprietary, you know, buy all this stuff for it. And people are like, how else would they be able to make that? Well, let's take a look at it this way. Um, if you take the Linux kernel, for example, which is massive, um, I want to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, I didn't do a lot of research before I did this. I just decided I was going to talk and maybe that's a bad idea, but I want to say it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 million lines, um, maybe up closer to 40 now. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I think that's about right. But anyway, um, I read somewhere that it would be roughly about 1.3 or 1.4 billion dollars if it was proprietary cost. That's that's the proprietary cost to create this is 1.4 billion dollars. Well, thanks to the shared R&D and the companies that actually pay the devs and pay to have this kernel created, the cost per user is zero. I.e., the cost to us, the people that are actually using it on our Linux desktop and all that, it's it's zero dollars. The the servers that are running it. It's zero dollars to have the Linux kernel on there because these companies that want this kernel and want this stuff implemented in there, they are footing the bill. They are paying that $1.4 billion to pay the devs, to pay all this other stuff, to have this kernel made because they know it's going to benefit them. And then since it's already paid for, then that per user cost to us is zero dollars. It costs us nothing to, to use this Linux kernel. You can go to the kernel.orgs and download the source code and do what you want with it. And it is there for your use. So the idea that the cost of it is a roadblock, yes, cost is a consideration. Cost is always a consideration when it comes to stuff like this, but the ability to have it funded by companies that need it and then distributed freely to the people that want to use it is just kind of a an example of how it works, even though it costs a lot of money. Um, kind of along the same lines as that argument is you get the, with no generated revenue comes no future. You know, people say, well, GPL, you don't get any royalties from code. So I make it once, get paid once, and that's it. Well, 
Yes and no. From the code, there's no royalties. You can create this code. These companies create code and give it the GPL license. And yes, from that code, you're getting no royalties. Okay, so why is that a good idea? Well, look at Red Hat. Red Hat, I think, makes somewhere in the neighborhood of $4 billion in revenue um, based on support models. Their code is free, but they have support plans for these companies and these businesses that use it. So, hey, you know, we're going to give you this for free, but if you want us to back it up and help you out and do whatever and the support and blah, 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 you pay X amount. So the code is free. You can get it. You can modify it. You can do whatever you want with it. But if you want our help once you have it, then we do have support plans. We have infrastructure. We have all this other stuff that you can pay us for uh, to make your experience better. Um, GitLab, I want to say, is 580 80 million dollars uh something like that um but it's just it's 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 there's ways around getting money and getting revenue from the code there is ways around being able to or the argument of hey i can't make this free and open source or free because I can't generate revenue off of it. Well, that's not true. You can generate revenue based on support. You can generate revenue based on infrastructure. You can generate revenue for that code based on other ways other than charging and other than having the software locked off. Um, so there's... People say, talk about GPL and they talk about the fact that compliance for GPL could literally bankrupt them. And what do I mean by that? All the data, all the, there's terabytes and terabytes. That say you have this massive amount of data and it's terabytes to host if you wanted to host it all and have it all out there for open source. It costs you, I don't know, $50,000 a month for your bandwidth to be able to host all that. Well, okay, that sounds like a reasonable argument, right? Well, let's take a look at this. GitHub. GitHub hosts 630 million plus repos for free. That's estimated in 2025. Debian has 88 plus mirrors. Cloudflare, Cloudflare R2 is about 0 0.015 cents per gigabyte per month. So saying that hosting all that is going to bankrupt you is not true. It's just not true. So the next argument we're going to go on to is a lot of people say that considering you, if you don't have any pro tools, if you don't have these proprietary tools, then there's not going to be any quality because yes, if you do look at a lot of the free uh, software out there, it's a lot of it's ugly and a lot of the functionality on stuff is pretty bad. Um, you know, o Adobe generates uh, over $20 billion in revenue, I want to say, um, and it's great. It's a great tool. Um, I don't use it personally because I don't have Windows and it doesn't work on Linux. Uh, the Adobe Suites are a fantastic tool. If you want to get in something that is state of the art, that is slick, that has the features and all that, yes, Adobe is great. And yes, it costs money to use it. And they justify that with, hey, look at how great our product is. We had what? We had Blender. Blender was a joke back, what, 2000 2002 something like that it was it was literally a joke and it was a toy to go and play around on but while it's taken a while 20 years or so blender has now been used in avatar and spider-verse so we've got these free tools that are now up there competing with the adobe suite on major blockbuster movies because they've come along so while you might say that the professional tools are more polished and they're better quality out of the box. Yeah, that might be the case, but if we can take the focus and shift it to the free and open source market, then these tools that are being left by the wayside because these other ones are around can actually get the love they need. I'm talking GIMP 3.0, GIMP 3.0 GIMP in 2025. Um, they released a couple new features. What is it? The uh, um, the CMYK and uh, non-destructive editing, I believe, is so. It, these things are progressing. These these tools that used to be literally nothing, that used to be the joke of the the market, are are progressing. And the more popular they become, the better they move, and the more features they get, and the more advanced they become. So if we can drive people to use the free and open source market as opposed to the proprietary software, yeah, we can actually improve these products. People have the 
the uh, drive to actually improve these because, hey, look at all these people that are using it. So the whole no pro, qual no pro tools, no quality, it doesn't fly with me. Um, we got people that complain about like security, that security is weaker without a budget. Uh, no audits equals slow patches. Well, no, security might be, I guess, weaker in a sense, but the fact that these open source projects have thousands upon thousands of eyes going over this stuff, because anybody that uses open source really knows that, hey, I need to check this out before I use it. I need to make sure it's going to be safe. And you have people that are individually auditing this stuff to look for weaknesses, to look for bugs, to look for any of this stuff. Whereas when you have a proprietary software uh, proprietary program, you have the team looking at it and yeah, they might be doing a bang up job, but it's less eyes. You don't have those thousands of eyes. You don't have people that are willing to, Hey, you know, I found this bug. Let me do a pull request. Cause here's a fix for it. You don't have that going on, uh, when you don't have the open source or the, excuse me, the, uh, the, the, uh, source code out there and available. So to tell me that security is weaker, I can see the argument for it, but I can also tell you that it doesn't fly. Um, do we have another argument of innovation dying if, if you don't have a team set up for it? No full-time coders equals no continuous integration or continuous development. Um, well, that's not true. We have LLVM, which powers Apple, Google, and NVIDIA. Co Kubernetes is 93% adoption now. I mean, the, these projects that started out or that are uh, free alternatives to proprietary software are just they take off and they continue to get better and they continue to be built. And it's not like people have this idea that, cause if you go to GitHub and you look at a lot of these open source projects and these free projects, yes, there's a lot of started and unfinished or half done or don't look great, but work, you know, there, there's a lot of that out there, but if we actually put the time and an investment of the drive into it, then innovation is not going to die. It's just going to continue getting better and better because, hey, guess what? We got more and more people that are, hey, taking this code and I'm going to audit this and yeah, I'm going to change this and hey, I'm going to fix this. And eventually it turns into something that is completely usable. So I'm saying all this because while I, again, I don't think that it is a one size fits all solution. I don't think that proprietary software is the way to go and it's the way we got to do it. And I don't think that, uh, free and open source is the way to go. And it's going to be, we've got to go straight to that. I do believe there's a hybrid. There is a sweet spot where the, they can work together. Um, places where freedom and free and open source software have already run servers. Linux runs like 70% of all servers, mobile devices, over 70% of mobile devices host Android. Um, we got cloud with AWS, GCP, and Azure. They all run open source. Um, AI as PyTorch and TensorFlow are dominating research in this area. So we have areas where the free software has already won. It's already leagues ahead of the proprietary. But there are places that I believe the proprietary still wins, and I think it should. There are places that I really think, and my mind could be changed on this. If you provide data and you provide a good argument for it, my, my opinion on this topic is malleable. I am open to suggestions and everything, but there are places that I, at the moment, I really just don't think should be messed with. Um, FDA regulated medical devices, uh, pacemakers and stuff. I don't want somebody being able to access source code for a pacemaker and thinking, oh, I can do something with it. You know, there's just certain things that it's like, leave it alone. You do not need access to it. Anything that is gonna need to, needs to be federally compliant for medical reasons, uh, for financial reasons, I don't want I don't want some financial company or some health records company going, hey, Jimmy Dingleberry over there in IT, he wrote a script that'll make our program even better because Jimmy's read a book on Python and he thinks he can do it better. And then suddenly all my data is released and all my health information and all my financial information is released. Yes, I get that that would be the liability of the company that was doing it. And this is a very extreme example because most companies are smart enough, I would hope, to not do something like that. But the availability and the ability to be able to do that if everything was open source, I think is a scary idea for some stuff. Some stuff needs to be locked down. Some stuff needs to be, hey, you can't touch this because guess what? Bad things are gonna happen or could happen if you do. And I just think that is the case. Some stuff just needs to be left alone. So while freedom dominates infrastructure, I mean, proprietary 
it owns the life critical compliance and low latency performance. It just does. Um, and like I said, the future of software is not all or nothing. It's not all free software or all proprietary software. In my opinion, it is kind of a hybrid design. It is a mix of both. It is the idea that we have free and open source, free software where it is beneficial and we have proprietary lockdown software where it is needed. And until I can see a good model that says one is the ultimate be all end all, I just don't think that saying that saying one is better or completely a blanket statement that one is the best and the other is not. I just don't think that is a very reasonable thing to do. So am I saying I don't support open source software? Am I saying I don't support free software? The idea of free is and freedom? No, absolutely not. I do 100%. I love using free software. I love using the alternatives. I like supporting these, these devs that are out there grinding away to make these programs free and available to people. Absolutely. I choose to use them every time if I can. But there are times that I think you need to use proprietary. In my opinion, you might differ on that. That is perfectly fine. I don't have any beef with that. But um, I do believe that there is a hybrid idea that we need both of them in the world we live in right now. And that's kind of my thoughts on this subject. You know, if you enjoyed this, if you like this type of video, go ahead and leave me a thumbs up, uh, subscribe, share, uh, leave a comment. If you have something to say, I'd greatly appreciate it. Um, I'm thinking about kind of branching out to do more of these. Uh, we'll see how that goes in the future um, and how this video goes. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day. And again, this wasn't a video to sway you to think one way or the other. I wasn't trying to change anybody's mind. This it wasn't a real technical video. This wasn't. This was just kind of my thoughts as to what's going on with this whole idea and and the, the argument between the two and just some of the arguments that that can easily be answered. Um, hopefully, I answered them clearly enough for it to make sense. And yeah, so you guys have a great rest of your day. Great rest of your week. Stay safe. God bless.